Michelle, one of our members and a presenter. Kay Kringley is another What in the World member. Um, and so if anybody would like to join with us and get ideas, we would love to have you on board and we just meet informally and, and make decisions as to what would be great topics to share with our community. So again, I'd like to welcome our live audience here, <clears throat> but I would also like to welcome everybody who's on virtually. And our first speaker tonight is Dr. Michelle Absher. Michelle is an assistant professor of science at Valley City State University and has been with Valley City State for a little over a year. She received a bachelor of science degree and a PhD, both in geology from Oklahoma State University. Her scientific background is in marine geochemistry, which is a study of chemical elements preserved in the seafloor that can provide insight into ocean chemistry, currents, temperature, and a host of other environmental conditions. Michelle will be followed by Olivia Johnson. Olivia is a biologist who has spent the last four years studying plants, soil, and greenhouse gases in wetlands of the Northern Great Plains region. And before that, she did similar work in the Great Lakes region. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in environmental science from DePaul University and Master of Science degree in natural resources from the University of Connecticut. Her research has been specifically focused on how plants, soil, and management actions impact carbon and nutrient cycling in freshwater wetlands. So I would ask you to join me in welcoming both Michelle and then Olivia. Thank you so much. Let me get rid of that little thing there. Got it. All right. Am I good with the camera? Move the camera just a little bit so you're centered. Okay. A little bit more. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I move around a little bit too. I'll try to stay in front of the camera just to make this easier for our online guests. Okay. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for that welcome. I'm going to dim the lights a little bit so that we can see the slides a little bit better. Um, I guess she already said everything that was on this first slide, but I am Dr. Michelle Abshire. My specialty is marine biogeochemistry. So um, the bio part of that is uh, microbial and, and a lot of chemistry stuff, redox reactions and things like that. But, you know, for, for the purposes of this discussion, I specialize in marine sedimentary systems. So I use elemental abundances, things like uranium and molybdenum in the sediments to tell me, uh, you know, what kind of uh, ocean conditions were present when those sediments were deposited. So we can use those to look way back into time, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, and we can look at those metals in modern sediments. And they all tell us uh, the story of the oceans. So why in the world am I here talking about the oceans in terms of climate change from a landlocked state? The ocean plays a huge role in the global climate. And we here in North Dakota and really anywhere have a lot to say about what happens in that really super influential place. Now, despite the fact that we're coming out of another very cold and snowy winter, uh, North Dakota's climate is changing. In fact, over the last 100 years or so, most of the states warmed by about two degrees on average. The latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that the state could experience an increase in temperature of nearly seven degrees over the next 80 years. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why that isn't such a great thing. <laughs> I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> But this is happening all over the country, right? It's not just here, it's not a local thing. Right? This, is a, this is a big deal. Most US states are seeing a rise in average temperatures and they have been seeing that over the last century. Changing the climate is likely to increase our demand for water. Rising temperatures increase evaporation, increases the amount of water used by plants, including our food crops. Uh, but rainfall is also likely to increase, all right? More rain means more water delivered to, to rivers and lakes and reservoirs, at least in the short term. The resulting increase in river flows could benefit a lot of people. And while that sounds okay, 
Droughts are also likely to become more frequent and probably more severe in downstream states. When droughts lower the water levels enough to hinder river navigation, water is released from the upstream dams, making that water less available to us here in North Dakota where we might be receiving a little bit more than we normally do. Warmer air also tends to have more water vapor, so more water can be potentially released in a storm. During the last 50 years, the amount of rain falling during the wettest four days of the year has increased by about 15% in the Great Plains. Over the next several decades, heavy downpours are likely to account for an increasing fraction of all the precipitation that we see. When you get a heavy downpour, less water is going to infiltrate into the soil which means most of the falling water ends up as runoff in these types of storms. The result is less water sticking around, more water being delivered to the rivers and streams. So higher river flows, increasing precipitation, more severe storms, all of these are likely to increase our risk of flooding, which is a big concern here, right? So 2011 was one of the wettest years on record, and I probably don't have to tell any of you that. I was not here for that, but I have heard stories. It was not very fun. The Soros River near Minot crested at four feet above its previous record, with a flow five times greater than any recorded in the past 30 years. Flooding occurred throughout the state, including, of course, here in Valley City. In the Red River watershed, river flows during the worst flood of the year have been increasing about 10% per decade, since the 1920s. <laughs> That's the problem with those click through slides, right? <laughs> A change in climate is also very likely to impact North Dakota agriculture. But some of these can be seen as positive impacts, right? You hear farmers talking about that quite a bit. And some of, the, some of the things that can come along with that might not be so positive. But in our state, warmer temperatures have extended the growing season by about 30 days since the beginning of the 20th century. Corn and soybeans are now grown in areas that were previously too cold for those crops. And warmer temperatures are likely to increase corn yields in the future. Increased precipitation might benefit some farms that can capture the, the water without losing it to runoff. And although the longer growing season benefits most crops, planting dates might be uh, delayed, right? If the increased precipitation in the winter leaves those uh, fields too wet to plant. Rising temperatures can also reduce yields of wheat. Warmer temperatures promote the growth of weeds and pests. And hotter summers are also likely to dry the soil a little bit more than normal. In fact, over the, the next 70 years, the number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit is likely to double in our state, and that could add further stress to crops and water supplies. A change in climate also takes a toll on human health. Extremely hot and cold days can be dangerous. Young children, the elderly, the sick, and the poor are especially vulnerable. The elderly are more prone to heat-related problems, things like dehydration, heat illness, uh, cardiovascular strain, respiratory problems. Right, people with low incomes are at risk of, of heat illness as well if they don't have or can't afford air conditioning. Power failures from severe weather can also present risks. Right? We saw that last winter in some of the other states. We were pretty lucky here to have made it through that one. But besides power failure, more frequent and stronger storms can impact people directly with injury from the storm, either bodily injury or injury to their homes, which costs money, which then puts you in a situation where you might not be able to afford health care anymore. And so all of these things kind of compound, all of these things can certainly impact someone's health. Climate change can also increase the length and severity of the pollen season for allergy sufferers. So for example, according to the EPA, the ragweed season in Fargo um, has grown by 19 days longer since 1995 because the first frost is happening later and later in the year. Other potential health impacts include an increase in more tropical diseases moving around the world as that climate begins to warm. There's also the migration of people from areas that are impacted by coastal flooding. That puts a strain on resources, health resources and otherwise. Then there are potential impacts to water quality causing health issues. 
the list like really goes on and on and on here, I guess is what I'm getting at. And of course, the impact of climate change here in North Dakota is not even as extreme or severe as other parts of the world. Some of these places are affected directly today by sea level rise. In Florida, some coastal cities are experiencing dangerous and expensive regular flooding events, even when the sun is shining. From 1985 to today, Miami seen somewhere around an eight inch uh, sea level rise on their coastline. Over the next 15 years, they expect this trend to continue with potentially devastating results. And even if you're still thinking, this doesn't impact me, people in Miami can just move. Where are they gonna move? Who's gonna pay for it? Who's gonna pay for the damages long-term, right? You are, I am, we all are. Not just for the relocation, the infrastructure changes to accommodate the sea level rise, but the cost of everything is likely to increase as we put more pressure on our economy and, and uh, all the stress on our economy from all of this. And this is just one place here in the US of numerous US cities that are gonna struggle with fighting a rising ocean. Our oceans are amazing places though. They're not just these standing bodies of really nice quiet water. They're constantly in motion. They're distributing heat through these moving water masses. There are surface currents, those are largely driven by wind. And then there are deeper currents, which are driven by differences in water density due to differences in salinity and temperature of these colliding water masses. And this is really important. If you compare where say London is to a point on the same line of latitude here, you'd notice that the climate of these two places is very different. And London has a, a, well, a much more temperate climate despite how far north it is. That's because of these wonderful ocean currents. They're bringing heat from near the equator to, to, the, to the northern latitudes. The Gulf Stream flows from the warm Gulf of Mexico up to northern Europe, where it then diverges. South, the water continues on. North, the water cools and sinks. Okay, these currents are the warm, uh, are, are kind of like the ocean's conveyor belts. Right? They don't just move heat, they also move nutrients. And all of these nutrients feed microscopic organisms in the water that serve as the base of the marine food web. These organisms also photosynthesize, meaning they consume carbon dioxide, they produce oxygen. And when these little organisms die, they sink and they take all of their carbon with them. And it's either recycled in the shallow water or it's delivered uh, to the deeper ocean where it can then be stored under the right conditions. The image here shows you where these plankton are. So they're concentrated in areas where nutrients are delivered to the ocean. They need those nutrients and nutrients are not equally distributed throughout the ocean. So these nutrients can come from rivers, washing things off of the land, or they can come from the upwelling of cold nutrient dense water in those deep water currents that I mentioned earlier. In fact, some of the most productive places in the ocean are above these upwelling waters. So the warmer colors here indicate the increasing quantities of marine plankton that serve as the base of that food web. And they're a really, really important part of the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle is really complex. Okay? It's, it's not something that we're going to go through uh, in just you know, 20 minutes or so. But at its core, every living thing contains carbon. As we live, we're constantly converting carbon from one form to another. We eat carbon, we produce it in our waste, we breathe it out. Every living thing on earth participates in the carbon cycle. It happens on a microscopic scale with microbial respiration. It happens on a large scale with photosynthesizing plants and animal respiration. Over the long term, the carbon cycle works to maintain a balance that keeps carbon moving through all of these various storage areas or, or these reservoirs. And this balance ultimately helps keep Earth's temperature relatively stable and it makes this planet habitable. The largest near surface storage reservoirs for carbon on Earth are fossil carbon. Right, so that's that carbon that's stored deep underground. So I think coal and oil and natural gas. And then the deep ocean also stores a lot of carbon. So that's where you have several chemical reactions that cause mobile carbon to become relatively immobile. Um, you have various materials like the shells of marine organisms 
uh, carbonate compounds and carbonate rocks like limestone that are able to hold some of this carbon. Another large sink for the carbon is anoxic sediments and more about that in a bit. And so chemistry is really regulating uh, the balance between ocean stored carbon and the atmosphere. Sorry. <laughs> so when carbon dioxide rises in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect intensifies. And that leads to some changes in the, carbon, the, the ocean's carbon storage abilities. The greenhouse effect, of course, is the result of the ability of certain gases to hold heat in the atmosphere. But too much of the greenhouse effect can make the Earth unlivable, makes it very, very hot. That was the case on Venus, and that's why nobody lives on Venus. Yet. <laughs> I don't know. It, it would be pretty hard for us to get there. <laughs> we got a better chance at Mars. <laughs> so any change in the carbon cycle uh, that shifts carbon out of one place puts more carbon in another part of the cycle. All right. When humans turn fossil carbon that took millions of years to accumulate, uh, we burn it and release it into the atmosphere. It results in an accumulation of this fossil carbon in the atmosphere, which warms our Earth due to that enhanced greenhouse effect. Now, when global temperatures rise because of that enhanced greenhouse effect, a number of things happen on the ground, right? So we have warmer temperatures because of the greenhouse effect that melt the ice. That melted ice, well, the frozen ice is highly reflective. And so it, it reflects some of the solar radiation that the earth receives. When you lose that ice, you lose the reflective surface. So you're able to retain more heat. You're, you're reflecting less of that radiation back out into space. You're retaining more heat means you're warming things up even more, which melts more ice, which means you have less reflective surface, which means your temperatures continue to rise. Right? This phenomenon is called positive feedback. And it's just where one process has an outcome that has a secondary outcome that magnifies the initial effect. <laughs> So what do we know? As a geologist, I look to the past in the history that's recorded in rock to inform me about the past Earth and, and how it's changed through time. We've known for a long time now that there have been large swings in the Earth's climate throughout history. These changes were a result of numerous factors. Some of them, not all of them, include things like the tilt of the Earth, the, the orbital path that the Earth takes, and, and the way Earth wobbles on its axis. But all of these processes act over long periods of geologic time, on the order of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions of years. So just keep that in mind. Here's what's happened in the past. Plotted, uh, you see here, we've got some ice core data. We've got temperature in the Antarctic on the bottom here. And then on the top, we've got carbon dioxide concentration that comes from the ice itself. Okay, so we know there's a connection between the rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the temperature. You can, you can see that, we agree? Pretty obvious. High temperatures and high CO2 occur at the same time. You might be asking yourself, what does that have to do with the ocean? I'm supposed to be talking about the ocean, I'm sorry. Remember earlier when I said that the ocean's a really big storage container for carbon? Changes in the ocean deeply impact how that deep ocean reservoir and ocean sediments are able to store that carbon. So to learn more about this process, I and some researchers from Germany and France and here in the US took a look at how the ocean responded the last time the planet warmed up dramatically. Okay, so we looked kind of here-ish um, when we came out of the last ice age. Now, as I mentioned before, climate variations are closely related to changes in ocean circulation, and this has important implications for the availability of oxygen in the deep ocean water, which impacts the ocean's ability to store CO2. So myself and the others that worked on this project 
Uh, we looked at the changes in the ocean conditions that are recorded in the seafloor to try and figure out how carbon storage changed during the last glacial period. What we found was that potentially anoxic conditions, meaning there was no oxygen in the deep ocean water. These anoxic conditions were occurring in parts of the South Atlantic Ocean during the last glacial interval. Now that's kind of opposite what some scientists previously believed or had, had speculated. When deep ocean currents slow or change, it can deprive the bottom water of oxygen, which means far more carbon can be stored because oxygen is the biggest factor in the breakdown of organic carbon to produce CO2. And that's precisely what we say with these samples. So I've, I've selected a plot here that was in the paper. I don't wanna bore you with all like a bunch of geochemical data. I just wanted to point out that uranium, which is my, happens to be my favorite element on the periodic table. Uh, <laughs> uranium here, uh, in order to sequester uranium in the sediment, you need anoxic conditions, right? And these two go hand in hand with storing carbon. Anoxic conditions uh, preserve carbon. So when we see a spike in, CO, in, in uranium in the sediments, we know that there was probably no oxygen there. And so we were storing more carbon than uh, otherwise. Okay. So we see an increase in uranium concentration and carbon both in the seafloor during the height of the last glacial period. And that's shown as a blue bar here. So this area here is the last glacial maximum. So that's sort of like the peak of the glacial period and then we come out of it. And we weren't the only ones to see this in the recent geologic past either. There have been a couple of studies that have come out in recent years um, that saw this a, a very similar phenomenon. So Gilbraith and Skinner found that during the last glacial period, ocean primary productivity increased, as did carbon burial. <coughs> Rutberg and others used some very fancy geochemistry to uh, see the same phenomenon happening, happening to the south. And Togweiler and Russell found this to be the case and they reviewed dozens of research papers on the subject. So we know this happened. We know that changes in climate impact the ocean. And we know that, that changes in the ocean impact the climate because of this storage of carbon. But what does it mean for the future? Does it mean that the opposite will happen and less carbon will be stored if the earth gets warmer? If it does, that's kind of bad news, but that's kind of difficult to determine right now. Um, it's something that we're still kind of working on. Uh, but like I said, if that is the case, it's, it's kind of a bad deal. All right, but we know that things will change. That much we do know. How they're gonna change, still being investigated. So consider what I mentioned before about deep water circulation, how it moves warm water to cold places, how that affects surface temperatures and influences the climate of certain parts of the world. Those currents are again, driven by differences in density from differences in either salinity and or temperature. Changes in salinity from the addition of more fresh melted ice and less freezing of salt water will have an impact on how that water moves. Changes in surface temperatures have less of a direct, uh, direct effect on deep water currents because solar energy only penetrates so far into that deep water. But warmer surface waters most definitely impact things like weather patterns, major storms like hurricanes, and that can have an impact on those really important upwelling areas that I mentioned before, where all of those nutrients are upwelling from the deep water, feeding those big plankton blooms that are the base of our food web. And recall the other bit I mentioned about positive feedback cycles. Increased atmospheric carbon dioxide means there's more CO2 entering the oceans. Now water plus CO2 makes carbonic acid. This lowers the pH of the oceans, causing the water to be more acidic. Acidic water dissolves carbonate rocks, those rocks that have the amazing ability to store carbon for a very long time, which releases more CO2 into the water, into the air, which warms up the planet, adds more CO2 to the water, creating more acidic water, and so on and so on and so on. There's that, that mean old positive feedback. So the correlation between atmospheric CO2 and temperature is pretty clear. Changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations and changes in climate go very much hand in hand. But now we know there are a lot of moving parts that have played significant roles in the past. So that the total outcome was due to a number of different factors, each kind of impacting the other in a series of these positive feedback mechanisms. All of these systems become, inter become intertwined in such a way that 
A change in one impacts the other. The earth is a really dynamic place and there's so much that we're still kind of figuring out. There's so much that we don't know, but we're learning. The oceans are a really important thing to monitor. They play such a big role in carbon storage and carbon cycling. And it's, it's something that myself and a lot of other researchers are working on here in Valley City, across the state and all over the world. Now, what we can see happening now as clear as day is that temperatures are rising worldwide. And this is because greenhouse gases are trapping more heat in the atmosphere. Droughts are becoming longer. They're becoming more extreme around the world. Tropical storms are becoming more severe because of warmer ocean water temperatures. As temperatures rise, there's less snowpack in mountain ranges. Overall, glaciers are melting at a faster pace. Sea ice in the Arctic Ocean and, and around the North Pole is melting faster with the warmer temperatures. Permafrost, which is a uh, ground that is frozen almost all the time, if not all the time, is melting and it's releasing methane, which is another powerful greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. And I believe Olivia is going to talk a little bit about methane in just a minute. And sea levels are rising. It's threatening coastal communities and coastal ecosystems. Models of the future are influenced by the data of the past with one caveat. We don't know for sure how the natural systems are gonna respond from human caused forcing. And we're now pumping CO2 that's been stored underground for millions and millions of years. Carbon that's taken millions of years to collect, we're releasing within a few decades. And this isn't something that's happened before. It's not something that's been preserved in the geologic record. So we can't just really look to the past and say, well, here's what happened then. So it'll probably happen like that again. Nope. The best we can do is you know, model the data with as much information as we've got and hope that our predictions will be enough to change the minds of those with the power to slow down our CO2 emissions and allow our natural buffer systems like the ocean to catch up. Note that we're looking at uh, projections to 2100 here. So that's 80 years into the future. Most of us probably won't be alive in 2100. Um, I certainly won't. My daughter might see 2100. My grandchildren will most definitely see 2100. It doesn't begin at 2100 either, right? We're already seeing the impacts of this, this warming trend, and it's just gonna be amplified for future generations. It may seem kind of like a David and Goliath thing here, and that's certainly not what I'm trying to do. I know a lot of my talks tend to be a little bit gloomy. Sage can attest to that. Uh, you know, little old us against the world that seems committed to destroying itself and CO2 emissions that are rising nearly exponentially. But there are some things that we can do, both you and me as individuals and sort of the collective we. It begins with reducing CO2 emissions. Point blank, this has to happen. There's so many things that can be done to achieve this, right? One of the things you can do is use your vote to elect people who will make good legislative decisions about climate issues. You can vote with your wallet. Money holds a lot of power. Right? You can buy from companies and farms that are committed to fighting climate change. We have some here locally. You can come to talks like this, right? You can learn more about it, uh, you know, grow your knowledge of these important topics, learn about the wetland role in climate change, you know, restoring wetlands is absolutely something that you can do right here in our state. It all helps to reduce atmospheric CO2, right? That allows that important CO2 buffer, the ocean, to do its job. Okay, so here are the sources of information about climate and the impacts of climate change that come from these scientific papers and a number of governmental bodies and reports are all listed here. Uh, we are going to do questions, but I think we're going to do it after everyone is done speaking. So I'm happy to chat with you if you have any questions about what I was talking about, even afterwards, if you want to shoot me an email or something. Also, make sure you check out the Dakota Resource Council table there. They have a lot of good ideas on how to reduce your carbon footprint. And uh, with that, I believe I'd like to invite Olivia up. Why don't we take one question?
uh, yeah. they don't really have it's not really amplified or anything it's just i can yell yeah. <laughs> trust me i can yell okay here you go okay forward backward laser so the arrow is forward is that laser this is laser yep we want to go forward not backward that's right here we go thanks michelle am i in the right spot sam yeah you're good um I'm not sure. if you want to even take a step forward. The microphone will hear you too pretty well. There okay. You go. Everyone ready? <laughs> take a big breath in. Breathe out. You just respired. We're going to talk about that. I am happy to be here today discussing the role wetlands play in um, climate change and to share what I uh, believe are the wonderful world of wetlands that exists right here in our region. These are some photos I've taken across my few years working in wetlands. Guess I'll use a laser pointer since I have it. That's the Mackinac Bridge in Northern Michigan, the most beautiful bridge in the world. Have you driven across it? No, oh. I have. I'm going to say that, that bridge can't be in North Dakota. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 10 out of 10 recommend. Actually, maybe not eight times and they have to repair it. But um, so I've done a lot of work in the Northern Great Lakes and then here in the Northern Great Plains. And that is um, what I'll sort of start to talk about. I do want to share that, uh, again, I've been studying wetlands since I was a senior at DePaul University in Chicago, of all places, but I got hooked on wetland science in northern Michigan doing some field work at a biological station through the University of Michigan. And yeah, I literally have been doing this for the last five, almost six years now, going into wetlands, taking soil cores, plant samples, putting cool, clear chambers over plants and seeing how much CO2 they take up, how much methane the soil releases. And I have continued sort of that academic career through graduate school at University of Connecticut. And then I got a job here in Jamestown, well, here in North Dakota, over in Jamestown uh, at US Geological Survey, Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center. I want to be clear that we are not responsible for the hydrological gauges that measure the river flow in Valley City, unfortunately, but I am committed to helping people get the information they want. So I'm happy to find that answer of why that gauge is broken. I have been continuing my plant and soil career here. And as of Monday, I will be starting a new job, still working from home in North Dakota, but actually monitoring the wetlands of Ohio. So I'll talk a little bit about all the ecosystem services that wetlands provide. And one of them is promoting water quality on the landscape. And so that's why I'm really excited to start kind of this new um, venture of my professional career. I want to start with a graph kind of similar to how Michelle started with a the graph. There's a lot of information here. The first thing to look at is kind of that vertical line. That's showing the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. There's carbon dioxide, but there's some other greenhouse gases we care about. And scientists can kind of standardize all that data and just put it into CO2 or carbon dioxide equivalents. So that's what you see listed on kind of the vertical part. Anything below zero means there's a sink of carbon. And all of this above zero is all the sources of carbons. But of course, we're a human society living in a human world. So we have things like cars and electricity and industry that are totally necessary for us to survive as a species. And I totally get that. I was excited to um, show this graph because the electricity generation and transportation are two of the largest sources of emissions across the United States. And I think some of you heard about electrical vehicles um, last month here. The big thing here to think about is when we're talking about carbon neutrality, like I think we'll hear about in a few months, we're talking about making those sinks equal to those sources so they cancel each other out. So how can we do that? We can increase our sinks, but that's just, it's just not feasible to increase the sinks this much to match all of these sources. So we can also decrease our emissions. One of the final steps Michelle just mentioned, reducing our CO2 emissions. And frankly, it's gonna be a balance of both as we move forward as a region, country, and global society. We need to both increase our sinks and decreases our sources to find that balance. See, I wrote a bunch of notes here. I think that's all I really wanted to say. 
other than also keep these numbers in mind because I'm going to really rave about wetlands in the next 20 minutes. And I always am humbled to come back to a graph like this to know that we've got a big job to do in terms of fighting all this, not fighting, dialogue, conversation, uh, working together with all this other land use and industry. So speaking of land use and industry, I really don't want to spend a lot of time on this other than this was very striking to me to put our state in context in terms of the CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from petroleum and natural gas. This is a part of our economic identity and livelihood, frankly. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just putting these emissions and the magnitude of these numbers in context kind of where we are sitting right now. And we're sitting in a landscape that has changed a lot over recent times. So Michelle talked about tens and thousands of years, and I think more in terms of 10 or 20 or even 100 years. And since kind of the 1800s, when this landscape was settled by Western settlers, they converted a lot of land to use it how they needed to. And again, that's just part of history. I don't think we need to get too valuey or judgy here, other than say, this is what happened. When people moved here and started to farm, and embrace the nutrient rich soil of our region to turn it into cropland that came at the expense of losing a lot of wetlands and a lot of grasslands. So, you know, I'll talk about a wetland in a minute, a grassland again, are those native deep rooted prairie grasses that are really good for birds and other biodiversity. Um, so we're keeping this land use change in the back and front and middle of our minds throughout. When I talk about the prairie pothole region, I'll just say right now, I'm not just talking about North Dakota, the prairie pothole region. Can you, I'm a, friend, I'm a teacher again. Can you raise your hand if you've ever heard this term before, the prairie pothole region? So most of you, beautiful. Uh, this is the region where there are these specific types of wetlands and landforms across both the northern part of the US and the southern part of Canada. So it's listed there on that map. Another kind of agent of change or land use change throughout time is, you know, in the late 90s, not that long ago, it's when I was born, fun fact, uh, we realized, and by we, I mean scientists and policymakers and landowners and managers, they said, wait, wetlands are actually not just mosquito traps or mosquito hubs. They provide a lot of good things on our landscape. So they started to restore some wetlands. But that pace of restoration has not kept up with the pace of change to cropland. And I apologize, I guess I did sort of make a value statement here by putting this in red and this in green. Uh, and I really don't mean to, I just mean to say this is what's happened on our landscape recently. And I really, really like this graph because we're sitting what, right about here in Barnes County and all this orange means this is grassland. So those native prairie grasses, good for birds, good for water quality have been converted to cropland, which is good for our economy. I recognize that and is good for things like biofuels and some other proposed solutions. There is a really interesting paper that just came out and I didn't have time to put it in this slideshow talking about kind of the mixed bags of outcomes when you promote something like a biofuel standard. And that's not what this talk is about, but if you have questions about that, I would love to talk about it. Um, but all I wanna say here is, you know, this is recent, right? This is when I graduated from college. Uh, all of this land is still being converted to crop land, specifically corn and soy, right? So not even wheat or flax or sunflowers or all these other great things. Um, so I do believe most of that corn and soy is related to a lot of that biofuel. I'm really getting onto the biofuel. I didn't mean to, we're done there for now. Thank you for coming to my mini Ted talk in my talk. So again, these deep rooted prairie grasses transform to these monocultures of corn and soy. Uh, monoculture just means one, right? And listen, I am from the Detroit area originally. We don't really like monocultures in terms of just having our industry rely on one industry. And I don't think we should have our landscape rely on one plant. And we're moving to wetlands now. Invite me back for another DRC talk. I can go for hours. We're gonna dive right into wetlands on the landscape. So just take a second, cause I need a sip of water. Look here and look kind of in the foreground. So the background and the foreground of this photo and think to yourself, 
or talk with your neighbor and decide if you think the one in the background is a wetland, if you think the one in the foreground is a wetland, or if you think both of them are wetlands. This is like, uh, what was that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, so I'm gonna take my water. You're gonna talk for like 10 seconds to your neighbor if you want. Did someone say both because they can't make up their mind? <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, but that was actually the correct answer. They're both considered wetlands. So these little prairie pothole wetlands, we call them because they look like potholes, just like I've seen driving around the Detroit area in Michigan and the road. We see them on the landscape here. They're small little ponds. Sometimes they have water, sometimes they don't. Let's get into what the actual definition is. Broadly, can you hear me up front or do I, should I go a little louder? I'm good? Okay. I also don't want to scare you by yelling, but I always call wetlands dynamic interfaces of land and water. That means they're super interesting to study, but it means they're super complicated to study, just like the ocean is. Now, different agencies like Fish and Wildlife Service or the Army Corps of Engineers, they all have precise definitions they use when they're mapping wetlands or restoring wetlands or what's called delineating wetlands. I'll just ask for one more participation. Have you ever heard of wetland delineation before? Got some great Valley City students and professors here. Uh, in general, the two things that make a wetland or wetland are water, meaning standing water like a little pond, or even just saturated soil. So saturated mean it's full of water to its fullest extent. So we said this ponding condition and this um, picture in the foreground is, are they both wetlands? And how do I know that? That's because if I dug up a soil core in both of these places, I would see indicators of wetland soil. So really dark, call it like brownie or chocolate pudding looking mucky soil that indicates a lot of carbon storage and a lot of carbon accumulation. There's also kind of more secret indicators like um, evidence of I'm so happy Michelle said redox. Uh, uh, evidence of these kind of specific microbial processes that happen in wetland soil. And the other reason I would know this is a wetland because if my um, guidebook had some uh, wetland vegetation in it, I would be able to identify that there are wetland plants here. And there are specific plants that are uh, adapted to living in waterlogged soil and therefore are kind of also used as indicators of wetlands when we delineate or identify a wetland on the landscape. I started to hint at this. So we saw kind of a close-up photo of one prairie pothole wetland complex. If you are flying into Jamestown or Fargo, you might be close enough to see some of these from the air. Prairie pothole wetlands are small inland depressional spots on the landscape. I was driving here from Jamestown today and all the snow is melting and you know there's a few hills from here to Jamestown. I promise I was being focused while I was driving, but I also was like, well, look at all that water running along the side of the road and pooling up in these depressions on the landscape. Collectively, all these little ponds or potholes cover almost eight or just over 800,000 square kilometers. Um, my supervisor at work told me to tell you that the state of Texas is about 700,000 square kilometers. So it's a pretty large spot on the landscape that has these really amazing <coughs> ecosystems. And as I did my best to briefly say at the beginning, we are living in a matrix or a quilt-like landscape of ag, grassland, industry, and all of these things that are in conversation with each other. I don't think they have to be in competition per se. I think we need to do a better job of having all our land uses talk to each other to move forward in an improved way. And lastly, I, when I moved to North Dakota, to be honest, I did not know this until I moved here. North Dakota and the prairie pothole region in general is called the duck factory of North America because all of these ponds are great for waterfowl. And to be honest, again, hunting and fishing is not a part of my culture, but I have a very deep appreciation for the conservation efforts in this region 
And people are conserving and restoring wetlands in this region because wetlands provide things like those wild waterfowl and other wildlife habitat. They produce a lot of different plants and animals, so that biodiversity that we are pretty concerned about at a global level, we can do something to improve right here. We started talking about flooding earlier, I'm so happy. Wetlands are like sponges. All those plant roots in the soil slow down water. So when Michelle was talking about the increased overland flow instead of just dripping down, wetland plants can help with that when you plant wetlands along a river or even along a farm field maybe, we can slow down the water. We can also slow down pollutants. And I don't mean just like toxins that we think of, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus are really good for plants on an ag field, but they're not great for a freshwater ecosystem where they can lead to things like harmful algal blooms and other problems. And so wetlands really like those nutrients and they'll take them up and slow them down. And finally, what I'll talk the rest of my time about today is this carbon storage potential of wetlands. I'm gonna take a sip of my water. I'm not gonna ask you to talk to each other. I'm just gonna ask you to maybe think, you can close your eyes if you want, of a time you've seen a wetland driving along the road, or maybe you hunt or fish. And that's all I want you to do is just think about what you saw there. And I'm gonna take my sip of water, which is almost gone. There are two bottles over on the left. Thank you, I was just thinking that I might need it. This is a graphic from an environmental education website, um, neefusa.org. I know it's very hard to read. So if you're interested and you do any other sort of outreach or communication, check this out because I think it does a great job of laying wetlands in the context of other land use in ways we survive on this land. Again, it doesn't have to be ecology versus environmental science versus industry. We can all talk to each other. I've been instructed to keep this very brief. This is literally all I've been thinking about for the last six years of my academic career. So I could talk for hours. If you have more specific questions, if you're a student maybe, um, or a student of life and want to know more about this, please let me know. We're gonna go through the basics and we might go a little quick just so I get to the really important stuff at the end. When I think about carbon, when I go up to Cottonwood Lake study area, kind of over up by, now I even forget the city, there's a fish and wildlife thing up there. Um, I'm blanking on the city, I'm so sorry. It's about an hour north of Jamestown. I walk into a wetland and I think how much carbon dioxide is coming out of the atmosphere and being taken up by those plants. So high school biology reviewer, Wetlands take up carbon dioxide because the plants photosynthesize and assimilate that carbon dioxide to make all of their biomass. Wetland soil, think back maybe to that picture of the soil profile I showed, all that dark, rich, organic soil. It has a lot of cool microorganisms. So these are pretty much things we can't see, but we know they're doing, we can see them under a microscope, but all these little biological organisms cycling nutrients, um, they can also produce methane. Um, we'll get to methane in a little bit. This is the same sort of thing I just said, but in text version. So when I had that arrow down of CO2, I was thinking about inputs of carbon dioxide. When I had that arrow up, I was thinking about outputs. There's more methane coming out of a wetland than CO2 coming out of a wetland, but that carbon dioxide, there is still some released because plant roots still need to respire a little bit and those microorganisms also release a little CO2. This is where I was telling myself, now is a good time to mention what Michelle has already mentioned, which is the lack of oxygen or anoxic conditions mean a really slow breakdown of organic matter. And that's also what creates methane. So they're specialized microbes that are able to do their thing and live and respire in these waterlogged low oxygen conditions. And that has two consequences. One, those processes are slower than other microbes that release CO2. And the second implication is there is some methane release from wetlands. <coughs> 
So in short, when we have those quick rates, really fast rates of CO2 or carbon dioxide uptake by the plants paired with slow breakdown of organic matter by those microbes, that's how we get that carbon storage potential of wetlands. So it's a, a little different maybe from the ocean. I guess it's sort of similar. In the ocean, you had those phytoplankton taking up the CO2 and they die and they fall to the floor. Is that correct? Did I? Okay. I learned something. And I also learned that in college, but I had to review it just now. And here we're talking more about kind of timing, quick uptake, slow breakdown, storage of carbon. This is a nice um, diagram. And again, I can get you a clearer version of this citation at the end, but essentially we start with the CO2 being taken up by the plants. It's kind of stored kind of on each stop along the train, right? Some of it's stored in the standing dead litter you kind of see maybe in the wetland in the fall. Some of it's stored in litter that kind of just piles up. Eventually it breaks down into soil. That breakdown into soil does release some gas, but it also still stores a lot of carbon in that soil. So when we talk about soil carbon in a wetland, this is where we are. This diagram uses the term peat. We don't really call our wetlands here peatlands. They have a different type of soil, but um, you could just replace peat with soil and you get the same concept here. This is what it looks like when we go to the wetland and measure it. We just see how much biomass or carbon is there in the live biomass, how much is in that standing dead, and how much is in that soil. You can also do things like take the soil out of the wetland, put it in a jar, put a cap on it and see how much CO2 it respires. So these are all sorts of things I've literally spent the last six years doing. And I think it's really interesting. Back to the big picture. So all of that peat or soil we just kind of saw in that first graphic, this is where it goes. It gets stored in different depths here shown by different colors of brown across the country. This is a really cool study. It's an open access paper, meaning if you Google right now carbon storage in US wetlands, you can read the whole paper. It was done by a largely a team of scientists through the Environmental Protection Agency, but this lady just teaches at a college in Ohio. So it was a, a good team of, of mixed professionals. And maybe you are already starting to see they broke up the country into different regions. So we are here in the interior plains. The vertical part of the graph is showing you how much carbon is stored in different depths of the soil. And maybe since you're all smart humans and have been looking at this while I've been chatting. Oh no, the slides aren't going. I don't want it to skip to the next one. I'll just use the pointer. Interior planes right here. You can see our soils actually don't store as much carbon per area, say as in the upper Midwest where they have really deep, rich organic matter soils. There's two reasons for this. The paper proposes it's because our soil has been so highly disturbed due to all of our land use change. But two, the geology of our soil is just different from other parts of the country. And we have kind of more mineral soil versus kind of mucky peaty soil. That's why I never call it like the prairie potholes are not peatlands like that's up in Canada and kind of upper Midwest. I want to tell you that even though those mineral soils, they didn't seem as impressive as the organic matter soils of the Midwest, they're still really important. They store almost 20% of the total wetland carbon in North America. And they're doing that because they have the high rates of uptake and slow rates of breakdown. Really quick, this is like a cool flashy statement that you might see when someone tries to sell you like carbon credits or something. They'll say, look at this amount of carbon is equivalent to this amount we release. It's so important to remember what Michelle already said. The carbon that is in the ground took a very long time to get there and we release it very quickly. It just is what it is. So I always say, you know, think more about rates of uptake and decrease of organic matter and think more about timing. And like, this is still impressive. I just encourage you to be cautious, critical thinkers. 
when kind of a civil silver bullet kind of solution is thrown at us. This carbon storage is still super impressive, as I've already said, and I'll talk more about why. And I'm going to be done in like seven minutes. Is it okay if I go past eight o'clock, Shan? Yes. Are you sure? It's not too much yet. Okay. No. Eight o seven. Here Five we minutes. go. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> Wetland carbon cycling is complicated. This is what I think about both about, you know, what I've already said in terms of the CO2 uptake. There's some other important processes I don't want to like brush over too much and just let you know that they exist kind of groundwater, water under the ground goes into wetland and it has carbon and some other inputs. Uh, we're just not going to talk about those today. We've already mentioned that wetlands produce a lot of methane. They are the natural, uh, largest natural source of methane. And people like to use this as kind of like a bad thing. They're like, oh, look at all the wetland or methane that wetlands emit. Let's just dry them out. But when you dry them out, you lose all the other ecosystem services like habitat, water quality, and frankly, still carbon storage that wetlands provide. And important to keep in mind all the other sources of methane that we could reduce if we needed to. Uh, we're not going into this at all because I need to finish by 807, but this is another example of potential positive feedback loop. And I just want you to know that scientists are both studying what wetlands are doing right now, and scientists are always also trying to predict what they might do when we see more warming on the landscape and across the globe. And I want you to know when you see uncertainty, it doesn't mean scientists know nothing. It means they know they don't know everything and they're trying to quantify uncertainty and continue to study the past to understand the future. I, again, a whole nother talk about scientific uncertainty another day. What are the implications of all of this? The first thing is, yes, we need to restore wetlands that were once there and are now gone, but there are still wetlands across the state that we can preserve. And part of the reason it is so important to try to preserve What's already there is one, that carbon's already stored and we haven't disturbed it yet, so we should just let it be. And in fact, that EPA study found that, that the more disturbed a wetland is, the less carbon it has compared to ones that have just been there and are able to do their thing. The other reason is, so again, I'm always in awe of people like Michelle who can study things on like the time scale of 10,000s to millions of years because this is about my max, like 15 years is what I can think about. So that's what some scientists have done. I have not been on any of these papers. I just did my good old student literature search and found some data to show you. And all of these graphs are saying the same thing. <coughs> wetland carbon takes time to recover when you restore a wetland. So the one on the far left, you see it takes almost 15 years for these prairie pothole regions to start to see similar amounts of carbon as maybe a reference wetland. Same thing, this is actually in depressional wetlands in the Northeast. The solid line is showing a similar trend almost. I mean, it still continues to go up after 40 years, indicating we haven't leveled off yet in terms of our carbon storage potential. And then this final graph is from a global study and that dotted line are those reference conditions. And this black line is the carbon saying, 20 years after we restored a system, we're not even close to what it could be yet. I'm not saying wetland restoration is bad. It's great. We need to do it in conjunction with preservation and conservation. I'm just trying to really hone in on the importance of leaving the carbon that's in the ground in the ground. I'm going to skip this. I'll come back to it at the end if you have a question. And I want to talk about um, just the nuances that also exist when we talk about wetland mitigation. So there is kind of a no net loss policy at our federal government a little bit more at the state government and it varies. And that means when someone destroys a wetland, they have to replace it. And that's what Army Corps of Engineers helps with and all these private consulting groups. But we need to know that you can't just take the same area of land one place and call it a wetland in another place. There's lots of nuances based on vegetation, soil type, et cetera, that all affect carbon. So this is an example that, you know, deeper in the marsh, that ponded area can store a little more carbon than maybe up in the upland. That's all we'll say there. If you're a student and want to know more about this or just anyone, let me know. And this is a similar graph that people up in the Canadian part of the Prairie Pothole region also found similar trends. 
that when you go from different parts of the wetland into another, you see changes in carbon storage. And when you have different rates of time since restoration, you have different abilities to store carbon. What now? We still live in a mixed land use, highly managed state. And I, again, want to say that we can all talk to each other. We don't even have to be best friends. We can just talk to each other and say, we know we have lots of economic and environmental and ecological identities all existing in the same spot. This was super surprising to me though. I did not know that over 90% of the Prairie Pajo region in North Dakota is privately owned. So what does that mean? We all need to do a better job as private landowners and people who work for public agencies working with private landowners. One effort is the USDA CRP program. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of this. Great. Um, I want to just tell you that this is evolving and I'm really happy to see that because the USDA seems to be really open to feedback about what does and does not work, both in terms of economic you know, concerns from farmers and ecological concerns from scientists. So I'm, I'm really excited to see that program kind of continue to evolve. There's nonprofit programs like from Audubon, Dakota. There's wetland easements. I did put this on here in case any of you have strong opinions about wetland easements, please tell me because I've just seen a bunch of news articles lately about kind of the pros and cons there. And then there's federal legislation that offers these grants. So this is very voluntary. It says to a landowner, we will pay you a certain amount of money if you make this change on your land. And programs, or excuse me, organizations like Ducks Unlimited help with that. I'm also super excited to see Ducks Unlimited start to embrace other ecosystem services provided by wetlands. So they're you know, the largest nonprofit to you know, establish wetland habitat for ducks and waterfowl. But they're knowing there's a lot of co-benefits to these restoration efforts, and I'm just excited to see that. Super excited to talk about how environmental work can create jobs. It does not have to come at the expense of economic livelihood. It can be shifting where we see that economic livelihood. Again, I'm getting back up on my TED Talk stage. I'll step down and tell you some local people that you may or may not already know who could answer your questions if you have more questions about these programs. What to do now? We're at 8.06, I got a minute. We're gonna support and learn reputable groups of scientists and managers. If any of you are on Facebook or on the internet in general, all of these organizations have websites and Facebook and social media and they post cool updates. So that's something you can just do as an average citizen to kind of stay in the loop. And we need to do something now. There's still a large imbalance between our sources and our sinks. There's still a high rate of conversion of natural lands to croplands, and we know that the carbon takes a long time to build back up. This is what I would like you to take away. I am sorry to go over eight o'clock, and I also am very grateful that you took your time to be here. So thank you.